Greetings, Hi-Fi Nation listeners. This is the last episode of season one of the show. I had this goal of making the kind of show I wish was out there. A story-driven show about contemporary philosophy that everyone would want to listen to. I've committed to making a season two, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to do it without your help. So if you like the show, if you want to hear more, there are so many things you can do. The easiest would be just to subscribe to the show and listen to all of our back episodes. We've got great ones where soldiers themselves confront the ethics of unconventional warfare, the nature of the Christian and Muslim God, the philosophy of popular music, and more. I have a Patreon and a PayPal donation button on the website, hifination.org. You can subscribe to the blog there, or just like the Facebook page, and I'll have frequent updates about the second season. I'm also going to be doing a Reddit Ask Me Anything in June, about every episode, so be on the lookout for that. But most importantly, it's really crucial for small indie productions like this, without a productions or promotions team, for you, the listener, to spread the word. Share your favorite episodes on your Facebook or Twitter feeds. Tell your coworkers, tell your students if you teach, tell people who work in radio or print journalism that there's this really good podcast out there that isn't produced by the big names, but it's just as good. That's the only way I can keep doing what I'm doing. Thanks a lot. And here's the show. Let me ask you a harder question now. What does it mean when you love something? It means that you like it so, 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 so much. That's easy for me to explain, see? There are these experiences in life that are interesting because they're out of the ordinary. And by being so, they test the things we take for granted. And so there's curiosity, and then philosophy. But then there are these things that are just so ordinary that they don't inspire any wonder, even in a four-year-old. But the philosophy of ordinary human experiences can be just as hard and just as interesting as the philosophy of extraordinary ones. From Duke University, you're listening to hi Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. Today, we're going to look at one of the most ordinary of things almost all of us start experiencing as soon as we're born. Love. And we're going to follow this ordinary thing through the stages of life. What is love like from the moment a person is born right through the moments before and after death? We're going to follow love throughout a human life from the perspective of the most ordinary but also most intense human experience, being a mother. On today's show, Five Mothers, Five Stages of Life, and the Philosophy of Love. My friend Yael was about to have a baby for the first time, just before she turned 39. I sent her a recorder to document the early days of motherhood. I'm suddenly feeling really cheated of the bliss that should have come the day of his birth. Like, I suddenly, it occurred to me, like, how that's supposed to be the best day of your life, and that was probably the worst day of my life. I spent most of it sure he was dead, and the rest of it thinking, okay, well, he's not dead yet, but what was horribly wrong with him? Yael had a difficult 23-hour labor that culminated in this instinct she had that something wasn't right, and so she insisted on a C-section. You know, they took him out, and then they couldn't get him breathing. They had two neonatal teams in there. There were like 12 people in there doing CPR, trying to get him breathing. I could tell from Marco that he was terrified. He was terrified in part because he was seeing the fear in the eyes of the doctors and nurses. We said first, like, all seemed confident, and then you could slowly see them becoming alarmed and then scared and not knowing what to do. This went on for like 10 minutes, I would say, where they were trying to revive him. Yael's baby Solomon was rushed away to the neonatal intensive care unit. She waited for an hour in recovery for news about the baby. I was sure at this point that he was stillborn. I thought there was like 90% chance that he was stillborn and like a 10% chance that he'd just been severely oxygen deprived and so he had to be severely brain damaged. Neurological tests on Solomon turned out fine, even though he wasn't breathing for minutes after his birth. 
It looked like there was enough oxygen in the umbilical cord to keep him alive during that time. If I'd gone for a vaginal birth, he really might have been severely oxygen deprived. Something terrible might have happened to him. And so I feel like I, I absolutely did the right thing and thank God I did the right thing. On the other hand, what this left me with is sort of, well, it's just sort of a more extreme version of what I think every new mother feels, which is it's just, you know, I, I am the only thing keeping this guy alive. It is all on me. It seems like every call I make could be a life and death call. That is having a really strong effect on how I'm experiencing the early weeks of his, of his life. Something I've been thinking about is just how much mourning I've been doing, despite being incredibly, well, I don't know, profoundly happy with this little guy. Happy might not be the right word, profoundly in love. But I find myself in some sort of deep and profound mourning for my old life and sort of feels like my old self. And I can be overcome with some sort of grief that almost can't, makes me not be able to breathe, like I've lost somebody, and I think that somebody is myself. And it's strange, juxtaposed with so much incredible bliss that he gives me, but I think that actually these two things are not, in fact, in contrast, but are kind of two sides of the same coin, because the amount that I feel for him, I don't know, that's what's changed me so profoundly that it feels like I'm, I've lost myself in this weird way. Well, the blitz has finally come, and that's a relief. Uh, Solly is five and a half weeks now, and starting sometime last week, all of a sudden, it was just there. I felt so much joy in him, and the joy wasn't constantly followed quickly by, oh my God, but he's going to be taken away. I had a dream the other night that Solly was in elementary school, maybe he was in junior high, and he was being excluded by other kids. He was just feeling so isolated and alone. And and in the dream, I was feeling incredibly nostalgic for the time years ago when he was just a little infant and I could meet all of his needs and he would sleep on my chest and I would know that I could keep him just as he wanted to be. And I was just longing, longing, longing nostalgically for that time in my dream and then woke up and it was that time. Yael Goldstein Love is a writer in San Francisco. You can find her at yaelgoldsteinlove.com. You're listening to High Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. When scientists study love, new mothers are often a prototype, the standard by which to see how love manifests in other relationships. One way you can distinguish between couples who are in love and couples who just lust for each other, is how closely their brains and body chemistry match mothers with their newborns. But so much of being a mother at this early stage is about basic bodily functions, pooping and eating and sleeping. But then something happens as your children grow up. Suddenly it's not about any of that anymore. It's about preparing to let go. So I worry about her self-esteem, suffering as a teenager, living in a predominantly white community, where my son was just black enough to fit in over there. And I'm really honest about that. He's light-skinned, green eyes, the star athlete. He could get away with fitting in and families not being like, hmm, who's this boy? I don't know that she can. You know, I remember her being in kindergarten, coming home one day and saying, Why can't I have beautiful blonde hair and blue eyes like my friend Audrey? From that point forward, it became such a goal of mine to really build her self-esteem, knowing what she's up against. It does make me nervous for, for her high school years. My name is Tiffany Ward, and I am a teacher. I have a 17 year old son who is a senior in high school, and I have a 10 year old daughter who is in fifth grade. It was scary because I was young. I was 20 years old when I had my son, and I was, I was 19 for most of the time that I was pregnant. A lot of people doubted that I'd be able to do it. I was in college full time. I was away at school, so I didn't have pretty much any support system being away. And then I came home about six weeks before I gave birth to my son, and I started a new school and full-time at school there, 
so when I had him, I had to get right back to school because in my mind, I was thinking everyone doesn't believe in you. They don't think that you can do this. You have to do it. So I had him on a Saturday Mm -hmm. and I took one week off from class and I was back in class the following Monday. And at the same time, you have to work because you have to take care of this little child. So I only took two weeks off from work and I was back to work. So it was literally like all in, so much internal motivation and also, you know, looking at him, knowing that I had to provide for him and make him a good life because that's what he deserved. We've been each other's best friends. We've been like who we've had. He's been my motivation. And then I've been somebody who he's been proud of. I think for him, he thinks like, my mom has done so much for me. I'm going to really try really hard to, to not disappoint her. So now he has a girlfriend, so he hangs out a lot with the girlfriend now. Because he and I have been so close, I think that it, it eats into a little bit of the time that we spend together, which was a ton of time. And now it's, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, he, he wants to go hang out with the girlfriend. Well, it's really changed the whole dynamic probably of my life because I'm used to working, going home, taking care of these children. Now, my daughter's already been social, so I'm kind of used to her being, I'm going with my friends or whatever, but then it would leave a lot of time for me and Zay. And now, not so much, so I find myself alone a lot. So that's a little different, but I think it's also a good thing because he is leaving, so it kind of prepares me a little bit. I think that if he didn't have her and wasn't spending some time out there with her, that I would probably be distraught when he left for school. But I feel like it is preparing me a little bit to kind of let go. Tiffany's son Isaiah is going off to college. Her daughter will start middle school in the fall. Most kids growing up really think they know their parents, but they really don't know them as people. They know them as parents, and they have no concept of what their life was before they were in their life, or how you adapted and changed just because you had children. My sister lost her oldest child when I was six months pregnant with Lynette. And I used to sit in Rock Lynette and realize this is what my sister lost. And I couldn't even imagine that because I just had this baby. When you're suddenly the parent and you realize all the stuff you have to do and all the sacrifices and the, it's like, wow, this is what my mom did. Diana is a fast food manager in Germantown, Pennsylvania. She has five kids. Randy's 27, and just moved back home after years of trying to make it as an artist in New York City. I heard so much about love in the early stages of motherhood as sacrifice, all for the goal of ensuring that your child thrives under conditions in which you have some control or influence. Letting go comes with it the risk that your adult child doesn't come home with the values he left with. Randy and Diana are having their first heart-to-heart conversations about who he is now, after all of those years away. I didn't want to be here. I wanted to be in New York, doing what I was doing, living my life independently. Needing assistance from your family, who not only, like, does that suck as an adult, like, feeling like you're trying to make it, and then now you have to lean on your family, but also, like, leaning on a family who you ideologically, like, so disagree with. It's like a personal failure. I have to constantly think about how I disappoint you. So I've never tried to make you feel guilty. I've never tried to, you know, shame you. You're not walking where I had always hoped you would walk. Our thought was give God one year of your life to get grounded in the Word of God and in whatever, then go do what you want. But of course, we were hoping that you would be the next Randy Carroll preacher. The thing Dad and I wanted more than anything was our children to follow the Lord. Randy's grandfather was also Randy Carroll, and he was a preacher. 
When Randy left home at 18 for Liberty University, the Christian college founded by the Reverend Jerry Falwell, he declared a major in biblical studies, giving hope to his parents. But then he left, not only school, but God altogether. It's only through these conversations that Diana is finding out about this. I remember crying all the way home when he quit school. And it's not because I love liberty. I've never liked liberty. I've never liked liberty. I didn't like it when you chose it. But you came home pumped about it. And I was like, Because it was the least conservative school that you approved of. Like, (sighs) their rules were less stringent. Which is hilarious because to the rest to the rest of the world, they hear liberty and they think, How how? Like how did you do it? I'm like, you have no idea the schools that I was supposed to go to. You know, for me if there is a God, it's about the See, pr- that's like, where I feel like a failure. For you to say, if there is a God. Like how did you live in my house eighteen years and you don't you can't say there is a God. But you say if there is a God. And that breaks my heart. I believe there is a God, and I believe there's a heaven and a hell. How did I fail you? How did I fail you? The most intrinsic part of who we are. And our sons don't share that. I can't really even give it a chance, because cause I did give it a chance, and it was like, it failed me. That would be where my mother guilt comes in. I'm like, what did I not do? Maybe I didn't share my values would take it more on me as guilt or failure did I get so busy with life I forgot to make that part of what I shared with my kids or I don't know somehow I messed up their difference in values ran deeper than just religion Randy and Diana talked for over five hours over three days arguing about things like Obama Randy's a supporter Diana voted for Trump Randy's a defender of feminism Diana longs for the days when she was still a homemaker, when she was much more secure. Randy's concerned about the war on drugs, Diana, about rampant drug use. At this stage of their relationship, disappointment seems to run every which way. Randy's disappointed that he hasn't been able to prove to his parents, yet, that he can make a life for himself with his new values. Diana seems to turn her disappointment inward. But they're making progress in trying to figure out what their relationship is supposed to be like, at this stage of their lives. I feel bad that you feel bad, but I, don't, I, I feel comfortable in who I am. Sad. So should I tell you that I'm praying against that? No. Okay, I won't tell you. I, I assume you are. That's what part of your faith mandates, I guess. Faith right. doesn't mandate that. I mean, that. but it's part of, like, it's I part of your... for you. Right? You're right. You're right. Did I tell you I don't sleep well after we have these talks? That's, I feel so much more at a peace from these conversations, though. Like, I feel like it's, like, good. Like, I'm learning so much about you. I feel like it's gotten us closer, don't you? Yeah. And that's what you need to, like, bridge the gap of understanding if, if either of us wants to make a difference more in each other's lives. Randy Scott Carroll and his mother Diana. Randy's podcast is The Cohabit, a podcast about the messiness of living together. You can find it at thecohabit.com or through any of your podcatchers. You're listening to High Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. Today we're following a mother's love through the stages of life. Gail and Sitsi Jaji are mother and daughter, who are at the stage of life where the roles are starting to reverse. Gail was a missionary teacher in Zimbabwe, where she met Lazarus and had two children, both now middle-aged. Sitsi is a professor of global black literature at Duke University. I asked Gail to characterize what it's like to be a mother at this stage of life. It's a time to be proud. <laughs> you can lean back, you, you don't have to raise them anymore, you're, you're not trying to change them and get them go down the right path. You're looking and seeing that they're now standing as 
on their own as adults and that it, that they're they're successful at what they're doing and that they're happy doing what they're doing I, I think that as you begin to recognize your children as adults it stops being your responsibility um, and it, it, it gives you time to sit back and say yeah I've done my job and I'm very, very proud of them. Tsitsi, on the other hand, is in many ways closer to a new mother and that she's inhabiting the role of caretaker and all of the challenges that it involves. I hate seeing someone who was my model of, like, daring do. I hate seeing this woman who said, gosh, I think God wants me to go teach teachers in the middle of a war zone, so boom, I'm going to do it, you know. <laughs> um, turn into someone who would like nothing better than to read devotional magazines at home, you know, with three lamps on and take a nap. <laughs> and I'm like, who is this person and where did my mother go? At least there's a script for mothering, a societal script and kind of like recognition of the you should give up your seat for a pregnant woman or for a mother with a small child and things like that. There really isn't much of that for daughtering in the same way at this stage of life. There's a group here at Duke called Daughters Concerned for Aging Relatives. There is no sons for <laughs> concerned for aging relatives because it is invariably the women who carry the burden of shepherding their older relatives. What roars back at you is the ways that patriarchy places all of these expectations in play that your own mother was also part of. Gail was the caretaker for her mother at the end of her life. Gail was also a professor. Tsitsi is in many ways inheriting so much from Gail. Here I am, you know, I've got, I just was handing my students their Audre Lorde for class today. And, you know, I, in my bio, I use, you know, feminist methodologies and blah, blah, blah. Um, but when it comes to making everyday decisions about whose agenda takes priority, my parents' happiness oftentimes is one of the top priorities. And I'm now comfortable saying nobody can be happy every day. But even that, like the idea that the fact that I please them maybe 70% of the time is good enough and not like 100% of the time is like a journey. Love in many ways is gendered. Talking to Tsitsi made me realize just how strongly our society uses love to force women into the caretaking roles we expect of them. It's deeply unfair to women and a little tragic for men also. We won't ever get to experience the joys of motherhood, but we can try. I'll put you on the spot a little bit and ask you, think back to mothering at these different stages. Think about the mothers going through that and maybe give them a little bit of advice or perspective. I would say the one thing is to trust yourself, to, to trust your instincts and your, and what you've learned from your own mother. I mean, that's what I leaned upon is remembering what my mother, how my mother treated me, and, and that helped me to be a good mother at every stage. You're listening to High Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. There are a host of emotions that seem to accompany human love at each stage of life, so much so that I wonder whether there's some kind of necessary connection between them. Anxiety, longing, disappointment, regret, resentment, failure, pride. But it's important that we're not too hasty in generalizing about love when looking at its best or worst moments. There's this final emotion, though, that I'm a lot more certain is necessarily connected to human love. And that's devastation at its loss. Elaine Mitchell passed away in July of 2015. She was a teacher and writer. Her daughter, Rachel, had moved in to take care of her in the last months of her life. 
Here's Rachel. Hey, Mom. I'm here at your bench. Looks really good. It's just what you wanted. Well, you really have missed a lot in the past year. And the holidays and birthdays haven't been the same without you. Bringing up something inappropriate at the table, like furries. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that laugh. I really wish I could talk to you. Yeah. That's a common thing I keep reading that people are here. That if only I could just pick up the phone once and talk to her again. If you want, just talk to me. Just think you're talking to me. It's not the same as you actually being alive and here right now. It's not the same, but... No, it's not the same. <laughs> no, it's not the same. I sometimes just think you're on a really long, silent meditation retreat. But I wish you were here. I know. I wish I were here, too. <laughs> I just don't know how to get through this without you. I mean, I, I knew I would be sad. But I never knew I'd be this sad. What would you tell me if you were here? I would tell you that everybody has a lot of sadness in their life. Everybody does, no matter what they look like on the outside. And sometimes you go for a w quite a long time with everything great. But everybody does suffer, and so it's not weird or wrong or not socially acceptable to be sad. I know it's not weird, but I'm not always sure I know what to do. Well, one thing is just to sit with it. That's the Buddhist way. You just feel the loss and the pain. And it'll move. It'll move a lot faster than if you try to, like, just take it away or suppress it or, you know. It's just better to say, I'm missing my mother right now. I just can't get over the fact that you won't be here to see some really big things in my life. Like if I get married or have a kid. I couldn't be any prouder of you than I am today, but I wish I could see that. I do. Mm -hmm. I just had a thought. Yeah? If you do have a daughter, could you give her Elaine even as a middle name? Sure. Okay. I would like that. I've been given a lot in my life, and I've had real losses and grief, too. And one of them is that I wish my mom could be here, but everybody gets both. I did get some really good mothering, and I mean, it's a complicated relationship, but I think ours has been great and that great is better than perfect we're a mother and daughter uh son and <laughs> we're we're very entwined so like you'll never forget me i mean the grief will fade and it's funny with me and i don't know if it'll happen with you but every once in a while i'm just hit by it and, you know, every once in a while, I'll just think of my father and just really want to talk to him. And, 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 and with my mother, it's <laughs> quite often on the radio. I don't know why, but they play I'll Be Seeing You, and that was our song. And, and it makes me cry. <laughs> so... I'll be seeing you in all I just wish somebody would have told me that the luck was going to run out so soon. I wish you didn't have to leave me. I don't want to leave you either. <laughs> so, like, from right now, I think, well, I'm not going to. So in some way or another, a light bulb will flicker or something will happen mm -hmm. and you'll know I'm around. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just so hard to fathom that we will never be together again. The dialogue doesn't stop. Like, it's, it's final, but the person is, has been and is so a part of you that, you know, you can feel... Like, I used to feel my dad's presence around me quite often. And whatever that meant, and whatever the reason, it felt like being embraced or helped or held or something. That sounds really nice. But I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, am I going to feel 
your presence like a ghost in the room? Okay, Rachel, you think you're so rational, but you're sitting here on a bench talking to a picture. I know you're dead. I was there when it happened. 7.23 p.m. on July 6th. That's when you took your last breath. You can't really escape suffering and pain. If you live long enough, illness, old age, nobody can. It's part of who we are. And it's part of life. And it really sucks that for both of us that I had to go before I went. But you have in you anything I gave you. You're really, really going to be all right. And I just know that for sure. Thanks. I don't know if I totally believe that right now, but I guess I'll take your word for it. I love you. I'll talk to you later. Rachel Matlow and her mother Elaine. The entire unedited piece, Dead Mom Talking, originally aired on CBC Radio's The Sunday Edition. Rachel also won the Best New Artist Award for the piece at the 2016 Third Coast Festival. You're listening to hi Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. We finally come to the philosophy of love. Philosopher Kieran Setia teaches at MIT. I think there is something kind of singular about parenthood as a project to engage in. The thing that's most puzzling and philosophically distinctive about parenthood is the idea that you're deciding to have a child and the question of what the reasons are is puzzling. It's hard to describe in terms of the ordinary categories philosophers use. The categories that Setia has in mind are things like self-interested reasons, where we seek to understand a person's actions by looking at how it benefits them. When I talked to Setia, we were using parenthood as a placeholder for the very basic human drive to seek out loving relationships in general. Is the goodness of seeking a loving relationship reducible to some kind of self-interest? It isn't as obvious as it seems that love is good because of the personal pleasures we get out of it. Philosopher Susan Wolfe of UNC Chapel Hill. Hedonism is the view that the only thing that's ultimately or fundamentally good is pleasure and the absence of pain. If hedonism were true, then the question of whether love was good would be a function simply of the degree to which it brings pleasure or pain. And it would be good just insofar as it brought more pleasure and less pain. That seems problematic because some of the most deeply valued relationships, you don't know necessarily ahead of time whether they're going to bring more pleasure or pain. And I would hazard to add, you don't even know when you assess your entire life whether a loving relationship has brought you more pleasure or pain. That kind of thinking seems beside the point. I don't think most people make the decision to have a child primarily on the basis of what it's going to be like for them. What the kind of reasons we do have have to do with pictures of the shape of a human life and what kind of life seems to us worthy of a human being. The shape of a human life is bounded. There's a beginning, middle, and end. And that end structures the life into stages. The hypothesis here is that feelings of pleasure, pain, even happiness, at any given stage, or even in life as a whole, are not the central considerations in determining whether to have certain loving relationships. There's something of intrinsic value to those relationships, Susan Wolfe has an argument that displays this kind of intrinsic value and shows how love brings with it other values. It's through love that you are necessarily attached to the world. For me, the best way to think of it is by mentioning the experience machine, which is a philosophical thought experiment where you're asked to imagine that there's a machine that you can plug into and then and electrodes will stimulate in your head the uh, illusion of living whatever life you think of as the ideal and perfect life. If you're a hedonist and think the only thing worthwhile in life, in my life, is for me to be as happy as possible, then the machine will give you those experiences. It'll be programmed in and so on. And if we only cared about our happiness, there would be no reason for us not to plug ourselves into the machine. But Susan Wolfe thinks that we wouldn't do it. 
That is, we wouldn't do it insofar as there are loved ones in our life, and we couldn't take them with us into the machine. If this is true about you, it means that you wouldn't trade being with your loved ones in the real world for all of the subjective pleasures and happiness something like an experience machine could give you. For me, that illustrates the fact that loving something other than yourself connects you to the real world in a way in which nothing else does, and thus will motivate you to care about what's going on in that world. We don't aim for love, for the pleasures and pain that it provides. But nonetheless, love is connected with the most intense human pleasures and the most intense human pains. How could something of intrinsic value be so paradoxical in what else it happens to cause in the world? Why does love give rise to so many conflicts between mothers and their children? There's such a strong tendency for the parent to want the child to be in some way like them, and maybe vice versa. The parent wants the child to be someone that, from the parent's point of view, they can identify strongly with, and the child wants the parent's approval in a way that is, I think, especially deep and profound. Philosopher Kieran Setia. It makes perfect sense that love for someone would manifest in conflict with them when you think they're going deeply wrong in their most fundamental values and orientation. I don't think it's there's some sort of ideal of how, how parent-child love should properly work in which these kinds of conflicts don't occur. I think it's right that there should be conflict in these kinds of cases, given what love for another person is. There's a picture of an ideal or perfect kind of love as the kind that doesn't have conflict in it. Susan Wolf talked to me about a view she has about the quality of love, where it doesn't necessarily line up with the quality of a relationship. In other words, you can have an ideal love in a non-ideal relationship, and vice versa. If you love someone, you want them not only to be happy, but to be their best selves. You can't help with that if you can't even see that they aren't their best selves already. The best way to love someone, the best kind of loving relationship, is one that doesn't have blinders on or blinkers on, that that can see things and for what they are, and that will include negative things. That's just part of the humanity that you embrace when you love another actual human being. For Susan Wolf, a better love, a more ideal love, is one where two people are able to see the reality of the other person, including their imperfections, perceived faults, or actual faults. And this drive to change a person for the better it comes from this better form of love. When two people clash about what makes for a valuable life, this better form of love is paradoxically what fuels conflict in a relationship. Uh, as your children become less dependent and more autonomous, there's a question of how you adjust from treating them as children to treating them as adults. That's a complex transition on both sides because it involves navigating the independence and autonomy of your child from the family unit. There's a real challenge when you think that your child's or your parent's political views are wrong. What would be a more apt expression of love? Would it be to try to change their mind, to try to make them better, to try to help them see that they're wrong, or to just respect their autonomy and difference and just back off? The conflict is partly intense because you can't, with someone you really love and care about, you actually care that they're good people. You want them to be good people, and it's very difficult when you love someone to believe that they're not a good person and not out of love to want to try to change them. So then the love is actually sort of fueling the conflict. Setia's recommendation is to think that love requires a different form as it reaches new and different stages of a relationship, particularly when you're faced with a conflict of values. There's a model for this from the Christian tradition. A source of reflection on this that I found incredibly fruitful is Christian reflection on agapic love. So the, the idea of sort of loving your neighbors yourself, which comes out of the Jewish tradition in, in the Torah, gets developed in Christianity through Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you know, you've got to love your enemy. And as soon as you're thinking of love as something you have to have for your enemy, you're going to have to think very hard about what that means. Judeo-Christian love 
agapic love, has interesting characteristics. For one thing, it's thoroughly unconditional. But it's also impartial. It's the kind of thing we think is best exemplified by Dr. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, aid workers in war zones that help every side of an armed conflict. There's a certain kind of caring for an individual in virtue of their status only as individuals, whether friend or enemy, that's characteristic of agapic love. If that's something we can have even for enemies in war, it's got to be something that we can have in personal relationships, no matter the conflict. It requires letting go of the grief you can have when your beloved does not share your values. But you still see their well-being as special and a required premise when you think about what to do. But there's a cost to it. Unconditional, impartial, agapic love is divorced from the intimacy that loving relationships have in human life. Usually, if you love someone like your parent or child, that love justifies treating them in a morally special way. You're allowed, maybe even required, to save them, feed them, and care for them even at the cost of imposing losses on strangers. Whatever agape has, it does not justify this special kind of intimacy and partiality. At least in the Christian tradition, agape is love you have for everyone equally. I asked Kiran Setia what he thought we could learn from love at the final stage of life, death. The standard philosophical view about why death is bad is the deprivation account. Death is bad because if, and to the extent that, had you gone on living, you'd have had more good things. Death deprives you of those things. And that has always seemed to me sort of unsatisfactory as an account of why death is bad. It seems like wanting to go on living forever so you can have more and more good things seems like an incredibly greedy kind of desire. Why would that seem, why would it seem like a kind of awful tragedy that you can't have unlimited good things? So I think there's more to the awfulness of death than just being deprived of good things. Thinking about sort of bereavement of loved ones, bereavement is a way to sort of focus on that. If you think about the experience that some people have of seeing someone they love in a state of increasing suffering, I feel like there's a kind of a sense of conflict that on the one hand, actually, it, it's not out of, it's, death is not going to be a, a kind of deprivation. It's not going to make their life worse. Things are really awful. And at the same time, it's very, very difficult to let go. And it's still incredibly, there's incredible grief when someone dies, even if you've convinced yourself that given the circumstance, it was time for them to go and it was the best thing for them. So I think what these facts bring out is this distinctive attachment to just the existence of people, people that you value, people that you care about. And it's the loss of that value. It's the loss of, it's the sheer loss of the existence of someone that you love that is painful, regardless of whether it's good or bad for them, benefit and harm, deprivation and neither here nor there. Here's an, here's an even more speculative thought. You might think it's, it's the, the loss of your relationship with them that's painful in bereavement. But I'm not sure that even that is right. So he, here's the thing I've thought about. At some point, hopefully long after I'm dead, hopefully as an old man, my son is going to die. You know, hopefully he'll have lived a long life, but he's going to die. And maybe at the end, it'll be time for him to die. And he'll have had a, you know, the idea of deprivation will seem irrelevant. When I imagine that and have this sort of anticipatory grief, it's not about the loss of a relationship with him. I'm imagining that I died 40 years before he did and he's still there. So I think there's some way in which loving someone and consequently having a sense of grief at the thought that they're going to stop existing, a grief that isn't to do with what's good or bad for them, and it's not even to do with the relationship. I think that kind of experience tells us something profound. The love we have for another human being does involve a lot of other things. Caring about their well-being, having them around for us to be with, to have a relationship with, connecting us with the real world. But if Kiran Setia is right about the grief we have at the loss of our loved ones, the ultimate value we place on people we love is not just about what is good for them 
and what is good for us. Love of someone shows that their life has for us a kind of basic, irreplaceable, intrinsic value. And if this is true at the end of life, it's probably true of the other stages as well. Hey, Al, how you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I wanted to ask you if you feel like you've learned anything about love in these last few weeks. Well, right now it feels so unidirectional. I mean, that's something that's very new about this kind of love. In the past, like, it felt like a love wasn't a real love unless it was mutual. I really thought I knew what it was like to feel that kind of love for someone because I felt that my mother and I had the same feelings toward each other, that, like, her life couldn't be said to be going well unless my life was going well and vice versa. Having Solomon within, like, hours, one of my first thoughts was I was so wrong about what my mother felt for me that love has never been bi-directional in the way that I thought it was. Like, the things that I feel toward her, like, yes, they're very powerful and they're very real, but they are not what she feels for me. Like, and it's not a matter of degree. It's a, it's a difference of kind. And so that's been sort of revelatory. This episode of Hi-Fi Nation was produced, written, and edited by me, Barry Lamb. For the entire first season, I owe my wife, Shanna Andraus, so much for production and editorial assistance. I want to thank you, the listener, for finding this lowly little indie production and for being my marketing team. The entire first season was made possible by the Humanities Writ Large Fellowship at Duke University. Special thanks to Duke Story Lab, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the Department of Philosophy, the Center for Documentary Studies, and all of the wonderful people at Duke who have helped with the first season. As I return back to Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, I invite you to follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Hi-Fi Nation, or go to HiFiNation.org and subscribe to the blog there. Please keep in touch with me as I try to get the second season going.